Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pagane, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I recognize we have people joining us from more than just Calgary today, um, across Canada, and I'm sure beyond as well. So welcome everyone to our October Calgary Adapted Hub Research and Community Engagement Seminar. As we have done for the last few rounds, we have started off with a presentation and then that has directed a panel discussion following. So today we have with us Dr. Carly McMorris, who is an associate professor at the University of Calgary in the Workland School of Education's School and Applied Child Psychology. She is also a registered clinical psychologist and the director of the Enhanced Lab, which focuses on improving mental health for for youth and young adults with neurodevelopmental disabilities, including autism, cerebral palsy, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Her work is supported by provincial, national, and international funding sources, and has been recognized by the attainment of various awards, including the Kids Brain Health Network Early Career Research and Mentorship Award. Dr. McMorris is a clinical director for the Healthy Athlete Screening Program in Special Olympics and is a board member of Special Olympics Alberta. Today, Dr. Carly McMorris will be sharing with us her work and the work that her team does around disentangling the association between physical activity and mental health for youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Dr. McMorris, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, me today uh, while we talk about this super important topic. I'm just going to make sure that I can. Um, there we go. Can everyone see my slides okay? Awesome. Um, and I also just want to say thank you again um, for those who are attending, but also my panelists um, or the people who decided to join us today um, are willing to join uh, to discuss this important topic. So as Leticia mentioned, I'll be talking about disentangling the association between physical activity and mental health in youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, there we go, switching the slide. So I just wanted to use uh, or sort of start with a brief language disclaimer. Um, so to respect both person first and identity first uh, perspectives, I'm going to be using um, both uh, autistic person and person with autism interchangeably throughout this presentation. Also consistent with the neurodiversity movement, I'll be using the term neurodivergent in referring to individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And just to, so that we're all on the same page, neurodiversity describes the idea that there is no right way to think, learn, or behave, and that differences are not seen as deficits. So being neurodivergent means that you may think differently than a neurotypical person, but again, there's no right way and it, there's no deficits, et cetera. So just in terms of an overview of what I'm hoping to cover today before we um, get to our panel discussion, first I'm just going to briefly describe the mental health issues that we know about that exist in people who are neurodiverse, then followed by sort of briefly touching on the risk and protective factors for mental health issues or what we know um, that might be risk and protective factors followed by describing sort of physical activity and mental health in neurodiverse people. And then describing some findings um, from a recent study called Cerebrum um, that I think many of you are aware um, from Daniela's presentation in the summer, but looking at some of these micro associations between physical activity and mental health, I'll follow up by just describing some brief implications and suggesting some possible mechanisms, and then we'll switch it over to the panel discussion. All right, so neurodevelopmental disabilities or NDDs are a group of disabilities in which the development of the brain is impacted. Um, there's a large number of different challenges and weaknesses that might fall under this term NDDs. And as I mentioned, um, neurodiversity is the idea that um, people who are neurodiverse may think um, behave differently, um, but again, there's no right way. And so this just describes those um, individuals who may fall um, under that sort of term of neurodiversity. And that would also include, sorry, just to go back, would also include people who have cerebral palsy as well. 
All right, so what do we know about mental health issues in people with NDDs? So we know that neurodiverse children and adolescents are at substantially heightened risk for experiencing mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. So um, in the case of autism, we know about 70% of autistic children meet criteria for at least one mental health disorder during their lifetime. And, but it's more likely that about 40 to 50% of autistic adolescents meet criteria for two or more mental health disorders. Um, when we think about people who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, over 90% of individuals have a mental health disorder at some point in their lifetime. And we also know that suicidality, um, both ideation and attempts, um, are a significant issue in individuals who are neurodiverse, um, and that people who are neurodiverse who experience mental health issues, they actually are more functionally impaired um, by the mental health issues than people who are neurotypical, meaning that um, these mental health issues, whether it be anxiety, depression, um, actually impact individuals functionally um, more who are neurodiverse than their neurotypical peers. So um, in terms of cerebral palsy, uh, we conducted a study a number of years ago using seven um, Canadian data sources, and we looked at sort of the prevalence of psychiatric disorders or mental health issues in adults with cerebral palsy who had um, or who were with and without an intellectual disability. And what we found was is that adults with CP were more likely than the general population to have a mental health diagnosis independent of whether they had an intellectual disability. We also found that all psychiatric disorders were common in individuals with cerebral palsy than the general population with the exception of addiction related disorders. And that having an intellectual disability substantially increased the risk of a, having a psychiatric diagnosis. And in this paper, we really highlighted the importance of identifying protective factors for individuals with cerebral palsy um, and really trying to identify those preventative strategies that maybe we can implement earlier on in development to prevent mental health issues from sustaining into adulthood. And what we're just starting to learn about is, is that the mental health of individuals who are neurodiverse um, was substantially exacerbated or um, worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, we knew that people who were neurodiverse had a high degree of co-occurring mental health conditions and reduced mental health. And this was across all levels of sort of symptom um, or degrees of support needed. Um, and that's been pretty well documented. So um, that having these sort of mental health conditions significantly impacted the individual, but also their child, um, the child and their family's quality of life. We also knew that prior to the pandemic that people, um, that individuals were more likely to receive special education and professional therapy services for those mental health issues. And that we also knew that there was a high level of caregiver stress in, in autistic parents or caregivers in particular, caregivers of an autistic child compared to non-autistic children and caregivers of children with other disabilities. Now, early on in the pandemic, it became quite obvious that um, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted substantially um, individuals who are neurodiverse, partially because of sort of this economic crisis and scarcity of essential resources in many households but also individuals who are neurodiverse experience significant disruptions to their professional services. And what's been found is, is that there was a worsening of sort of autistic traits or symptoms, um, behavioral challenges and reduce, reduce mental health even further due to sort of this social um, isolation. We also know that there was sort of school closures, reductions in professional services and additional challenges related to caregiving that may have been especially um, challenging as well. So attending appointments, receiving respite, obtaining equipment and accessing specialized services were things that then parents and caregivers needed to take on for the take on as part of um, during COVID. So in terms of impacts of mental health for those who are neurodiverse, we know that it significantly impacts the individual. So in terms of their daily functioning, their quality of life, their social and peer relationship, and it can exacerbate their existing sort of traits and challenges. We also know that um, certain mental health issues also have a toll on um, the family. And so really trying to understand um, how anxiety in particular in this paper impacted autistic youth 
we found that not only um, through these sort of qualitative interviews, not only did anxiety really impact the child and the caregiver and the family's quality of life, um, but it, we had families who were saying sometimes the anxiety or the mental health issue was harder to sort of manage or was harder to really deal with um, on a daily daily day-to-day -day life compared to sort of the NDD or the neurodiversity. Um, and so mental health sort of impacts the child, the caregiver, and the family all equally. Now, what are some known risk and protective factors? So we know that in there's these mental health issues that are quite common, as I've mentioned, and there's certain things that are inherent about people who are neurodiverse that make them at higher risk or heightened risk for experiencing mental health issues. And that could be things like social and peer difficulties or challenges and physical health challenges. We also know that there are certain things that individuals with and without neurodiversity that experience um, things like emotional regulation, adaptive functioning that also put individuals um, at heightened risk. And also these very unique characteristics that might be um, specific to individuals who are neurodiverse that put them at heightened risk. So in the case of autistic people, um, social masking or camouflaging is something that is shown to substantially increase the risk of autistic burnout, for example, um, or uh, mental health challenges. Um, and what social masking is, just for everyone um, to be on the same page, is when a person deliberately engages in behaviors um, to minimize or mask uh, the traits that are associated with um, autism. So, for example, hiding certain behaviors or traits that they feel like would um, put them at uh, risk of being um, sort of bullied or um, stigmatized, etc. And so social masking is something that we know is highly predictive of mental health issues, including suicidality. Intolerance of uncertainty, executive functioning, and theory of mind are also things that put individuals who are not diverse at um, risk for um, experiencing uh, certain mental health challenges. Now, in terms of protective factors, there's lots of them, which is fantastic. And so um, good coping skills, sense of belonging, a sense of identity or acceptance of an NDD, of their NDD diagnosis, um, and, or their neurodiversity more broadly, social support and engagement and connection to school with peers, um, as well as their culture, et cetera, have all been shown to be protective factors. For mental health. We also know that health behaviors such as sleep and physical activity are huge protective factors for the development of later mental health issues, both in those who are neurodiverse as, as well as people who are neurotypical. All right, so what do we know about physical activity and people who are neurodivergent? So research has consistently shown that physical activity in particular um, is something that individuals with NDDs are less active or not meeting guidelines for physical activity. So people with NDDs are less active and more sedentary than their peers without NDDs. And we also know that as individuals age, their uh, physical activity levels decrease even more. And so in particular, there's, um, as I mentioned, so there are PA levels decrease even more, and there's different factors that might impact their PA levels among this um, population. So things like um, certain uh, personal issues, environmental issues, po policy and program, and social barriers. So for example, personal things, so fear or preference for engaging in certain kinds of physical activity, environment, so inadequate facilities or um, barriers in terms of transportation, um, in terms of policy and program barriers, there's things like a lack of programs that exist. Um, team sports are primarily the focus, and if individuals aren't into sort of engaging in team sports, that seems to be something that is um, uh, that that limits sort of the availability of other uh, physical activity uh, sports um, or activities. Sorry, and then there's also a lack of staff capacity that really impacts the availability or the accessibility of these programs. And lastly, in terms of social barriers, there's a lot of time constraints in individuals um, being able to engage in physical activities, um, as well as sort of challenges that might impact their availability um, or other commitments like um, engaging in certain types of therapies, et cetera. 
So um, we also know that there's been lower levels of physical activity um, due to the pandemic. So in the context of COVID, we know that um, a lot of sports and activities were um, shut down or um, put on hold. Um, I know from a lot of my um, Special Olympics athletes that that was a huge, um, a huge problem over the pandemic was trying to stay active given that those sort of organized sports were more limited. Um, and so again, these sort of lower levels of PA were even further exacerbated due to the, due to the pandemic. Um, but the good thing is, is that we know that increasing our physical activity among youth with NDDs can really improve well-being by reducing sort of stress and depressive symptoms. So there's been a number of studies that have showed that um, increasing physical activity among youth with NDDs can really help to improve well-being and certain mental health um, symptoms as well as quality of life. So in collaboration with Dr. Laura Brenton, who I know is here today, we conducted a few scoping reviews to really understand um, how physical activity impacts mental health in youth with cerebral palsy. Um, and then I'll present some findings from um, youth with um, autism and, and um, those with intellectual disabilities. But in this specific um, systematic review, what we did is we um, looked at mostly studies that were quantitative in nature, and we found 21 articles that were included and that looked at the association between quality of life and mental health and physical activity. So of those that were part of that 21 articles, most, so 17 articles, examined the relationship between physical activity and overall quality of life and well-being. Um, and what's unfortunate is of those 17, there was inconsistent findings. So eight studies show that at least one significant positive association between physical activity and mental health or quality of life existed. And four studies found that physical activity interventions were enjoyable, but there was still some inconsistencies and only one study specifically examined the association between physical activity and anxiety and depression in particular. So there really wasn't much out there for us to understand how physical activity interventions in particular improve mental health um, in terms of anxiety and depression in particular. So what we sort of argued was is that physical activity may benefit certain aspects of quality of life and mental health in youth with cerebral palsy, but it wasn't a consistent finding in the literature. And as I mentioned, we conducted a very similar systematic review in looking at this in autistic youth who had um, who um, also had either an intellectual disability or did not. And we only found seven studies um, that were included in our systematic review that were deemed to be sort of high quality. All the studies that were um, examined looked at a PA intervention and how it impacted again, uh, mental health or quality of life. All the studies that used a group intervention included structured PA programming. So things like yoga, volleyball, football, soccer, swimming and exercise. So things like aerobics or flexibility and balance programs. And then studies assess sort of psychological well-being using a variety of different measures, things like stress, anxiety, emotional stability, and quality of life. And all studies improve, uh, reported improved in, um, health, mental health inter, um, post-intervention, but it really wasn't clear from any of the studies about the follow-up or the generalizability or the long-term benefits of um, the sort of P, uh, PA programming. And so really the, the benefits of these um, interventions or these PA interventions in particular long-term are really unknown. And so what we suggest is, is that really the sort of long-term impact or the generalizability of PA programming on the mental health um, of individuals who are neurodiverse is really unclear. Um, and there isn't much literature, if at any, examining that currently. So as a team, um, a number of us here at UCalgary and then Laura uh, at Western decided to try to understand um, or look at different mechanisms that might be um, underlying or can explain the association between physical activity and mental health in youth with sweet pea. So knowing that physical activity 
has a tendency to improve mental health in neurotypical youth. And there's been some studies to show that there's this association in youth with CP. We wanted to understand what underlying or what reasons sort of explained that association. And we really focused on um, physiological uh, factors. So things like sleep, pain, fatigue, and physical activity. So the results I'm going to show you here are um, just a snapshot of the cerebrum data, but it's a, it's a large study. We have about 45 individuals who have completed some aspects of the data, and I'm going to be, or the project, pardon me, and I'm going to be presenting on um, some of the studies from 35 youth. So um, 35 youth participated in this aspect of cerebrum. They all had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and a mean age of 11.7 or 11, sorry, 0.17 years. Um, as part of the cerebrum study, participants complete measures of quality of life, so things like the PEDS QL. They also complete at baseline a mental health measure called the BASC. Two, which maybe some people remember from Daniela's present um, presentation in the summer. We also ask about sleep, both quality and quantity and degree of um, restfulness, um, as well as pain um, in the last three months and physical activity. We ask a whole bunch of other things as well around family and caregiver, uh, but I won't be presenting those today. After participants have completed the baseline measures, what we did is we had them complete a seven day actigraph where participants wore the actigraph on their wrist as well as around their waist. Um, and then they were asked to complete daily measures of things like mood, um, also things like sleep, pain, fatigue. Um, and then uh, we also asked about um, different kinds of emotions that they might've experienced from the PANAS it's called. So these were things that were both positive emotions. So happy, excited, or things that were negative emotions like sad, stressed, et cetera. And then what we did at the end of those seven days is families mailed them all back to us and we asked them to complete what's called the KSADS or the Kitty Schedule for Affective and Schizophrenia Disorders. And it's an interview with families to understand sort of some of the mental health challenges that youth were experiencing. So in terms of what I'm gonna present, it's just data, data on the seven day actigraphs and in particular, the physical activity, as well as the daily reports on mood. And so preliminarily our results suggest that there's a, a quite substantial um, association between daily activity levels and overall positive mood. Um, at the daily level, so what we find is, is that consistent with previous research youth spent only about 1% of their day in moderate to vigorous physical activity based on our actigraph data. What we then did is we conducted some um, uh, multi-level modeling uh, where we examined how daily um, activity levels or percentage um, that participants spent in moderate to vigorous physical activity, as well as step count. And we compare that to then how that impacts their daily mood and their daily variability in their mood. So how up and down their mood was. And what we found was that uh, maybe unexpected, uh, unsurprisingly, was is that there was a positive association, meaning that the more time that you spent in daily physical activity or this moderate to vigorous physical activity, or the more steps you engaged in, you it was associated with higher overall positive emotions or affect meaning that people had higher mood um, the next day after they were spent time in their moderate to vigorous physical activity. We also surprisingly found a negative association between daily activity levels and variability in negative emotions or emotion regulation, meaning that the more time that a person spent in that moderate to vigorous levels of physical activity, the less variability they had in negative emotions and emotion regulation. And so when we started thinking about what might be happening here, we looked at pain and sleep, and unfortunately, those didn't seem to explain these results. And so what I sort of found recently, oh, sorry, here's just a, pardon me, there, a graph showing this sort of percentage of daily moderate to vigorous physical activity and daily negative scores. So we started thinking as a team, what might be some potential mechanisms or reasons why 
we're finding this daily, very sort of specific association between positive daily mood and physical activity. And there was this great paper that was just published actually a couple months ago that proposed this conceptual model. And so I thought I would present it today because um, to my knowledge, there's been very little looking at this specific underlying reasons why physical activity and mental health might be um, associated in people who are neurodiverse. But this paper looked at it in people who are neurotypical and they proposed these three areas. So one was is that there might be these sort of neurobiological um, things that are happening. So um, the reason why physical activity is associated with better mental health might be a lot to do with the structure and the function of the brain. So um, as you are more physically active, there might be this impact on the brain that then leads to sort of more endorphins and neurotransmitter changes. So really this sort of neurobiological hypothesis. As a psychologist, um, I am more interested in maybe the psychosocial hypotheses and the behavioral hypotheses. Um, so what they suggest is, is that engaging in more physical activity, such as organized sports, um, or just engaging in more physical activity can really help promote psychosocial um, aspects or psychosocial sort of um, um, mechanisms. And so things like physical self-perceptions, feeling more connected socially, and really having that impact on mood and emotions is sort of why we then see this impact on mental health. And then the last hypothesis or the last sort of contributors that they um, they suggested were things that were more behavioral. So things like sleep volume and quality and then those coping and self-regulation skills are really what's underlying this association between physical activity and mental health. Again, this was a model that was proposed for people who um, have are neurotypical, for example, um, and uh, those with ADHD, but not for people who um, have things like autism or cerebral palsy that has yet to be examined. So what are the implications of the results? And so what we know is, is that um, there's limited ex um, accessibility for mental health interventions that are tailored to people who are neurodiverse. There's very few um, interventions that are available that are informed by people who are neurodiverse um, and that are accessible. So a lot of the kids that I work with um, experience multiple barriers in accessing appropriate mental health interventions. Um, and if they do get onto a wait list, the wait list is 18 months long. Um, sometimes they are only seen for a certain number of sessions. Um, and most of the time, um, therapists or people who are um, treating the mental health issues will report not feeling competent or confident in um, serving individuals or, or um, providing mental health supports to individuals who identify as neurodiverse. So there's a systems level that really impact the availability of these mental health interventions. Um, we also know that the mental health interventions that do exist, which are minimal, um, don't consider this population's unique needs. So they're, um, again, not tailored to some of the strengths, as well as maybe some of the challenges that neurodiverse individuals might experience. They're very costly and have long wait lists. So what our team proposes, and, and this is area of research is really driven by uh, a postdoc in my lab, Dr. Brianne Redquest, who I think a lot of you know, um, is that physical activity may be a promising mental health intervention for individuals with NDDs, um, and that more research is really needed to determine who and under what conditions physical activity improves the mental health in neurodivergent individuals, um, and that physical activity um, and a physical activity intervention may the, be the best or maybe one um, avenue that is quite promising. So with that, I will turn it over to any questions that people have. Um, so thank you very much for your attention um, today. I can't see anybody, but thank you. <laughs> um, and um, I just wanted to go through real quickly and say thank you to my funders who support this work. Um, this the Cerebrum project was specifically funded by the Robertson Fund for Research in Cerebral Palsy. Um, I also wanted to thank our team. Um, there's a lot of people who make this research happen, and in particular, my Cerebrum team members, um, Laura, who's here today, Elizabeth, whose name sort of got cut off, sorry, on my slide, but um, a number of other people as well from our team who have helped out with this, this work. And if you need to get in touch with me, this is the best way to do so. So thank you very much. I will turn it over to our panel discussion. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, to get this panel started, I'd like to introduce by name our panelists and give them each a brief opportunity to introduce themselves. So um, we will start with Laura. Hi, everyone. I am a physiotherapist by training um, and an assistant professor at the School of Physical Therapy in Western uh, University in London, Ontario. I um, have worked a lot with Carly, and uh, it's really nice to see some of this work being presented. So thanks for your attention today and, uh, and a good conversation, I'm hoping. All right, Scott. Hi, um, my name is Scott Godfrey. I am a program coordinator with the Autism Asperger's Friendship Society, and I guess uh, kind of a director of the, an offshoot of that, which is Lacrossing Barriers, which is uh, promoting uh, adapted, inclusive, and uh, or adapted, inclusive sport for uh, any community that requires it. And just excited to be here and uh, looking forward to answering questions or dancing around them. <laughs> Uh, Kalem. Hi, um, my name is Kalem Deneau. I am uh, out in Toronto. I am a student at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm also an athlete in Special Olympics Ontario. Uh, I've also interned with them for quite a few years. I'm a person with autism or an autistic person. Thomasina. Hi, I'm Thomasina. I live just outside, uh, on an acres outside of Red Deer, Alberta. Anything else? Hmm. That experience? Hmm. I've been in spe I've been in Special Olympics for 16, 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's about it. <laughs> right. And Marie. Um, I am Thomasina's mom, and I also have a mother daughter who is uh, neurodiverse and uh, a person with autism as well. And I have coached um, Special Olympics and also been a teacher's aide for, uh, I've been retired as a teacher's aide in the local school system. Thank you each for joining us today. So I've got a couple of questions that a little bit tailored to each of our panelists, um, but then we've got some more general ones and each of you panelists can feel free to jump in and support the answer of someone else's question as well. So I'm gonna direct this first one to Laura. Um, I know Carly touched on this a bit through her presentation, but from your experience, what is the mechanism for improving mental health through physical activity and sport? Yeah, I think the, the picture that, that Carly put up was really nice because I don't think there's just one mechanism, right? There's so many ways that sport can help and have an effect on the, on people's mental health and well-being. Um, I know I'm a physiotherapist by background, so I kind of do like the, the neurobiological components because I think there is a really clear pathway that when we exercise, our body releases endorphins um, that kind of act on pathways that give us pleasure, right? So exercise is a really great way to not only reap physical benefits, but also those mental health benefits through some of that. But I think what I'm getting more and more exposed to with the work with Carly in this group um, and with some work here at Special Olympics Ontario is really around, you know, that inclusion, going out and being and just having fun, making friends, feeling, feeling like you're a part of the community um, and that you can go out and access the resources that are in your community to be physically active has a huge impact on the ability to continue to enjoy your life and to you know have things that are meaningful to you in terms of a meaningful participation in daily life so I think those are kind of where I really see the big mechanisms for, for creating change um, but we know this population is is really not experiencing the same levels of physical activity that even our typical development developing populations experiencing or our neurotypical population um, and even those kids and adolescents and adults are below what we would expect to be living a well healthy life so we've got a lot of work to do across the spectrum but I'm really happy to see the changes that are being uh, implemented in the neurodiverse population particularly. Thank you. Scott I'll direct the next one to you. 
How do you think that physical activity impacts the mental health of the people that you work with? <clears throat> um, short answer, it improves it. There's just no doubt about it. Um, I have a degree in fine arts and a partial master's degree. I only know about this because for the last few years and, and well, several decades, but in, in seeing this, um, the immediate within one to three sessions of any sport that someone's trying, if the format is there to allow them to experience it the way they need, they, uh, they, they're developing curiosities and awareness, uh, expectations when they're allowed to come into a, um, into a new situation, a new environment, <clears throat> a new place, a new building, a new set of sounds, and, and they're allowed to take time out, they're allowed to sit, they're allowed to wait uh, until perhaps they feel acclimatized to that situation or the echoes or the sound or the movement. When they're allowed to wear noise canceling headphones to uh, learn to play lacrosse, um, we use a tennis ball, so noise canceling headphones are fine. Uh, <laughs> and when they're allowed that, um, they, they develop an awareness of the sport of their environment of being in a group. It's not necessarily a team sport, but their ability to interact. Short term, over six weeks uh, to 10 weeks, uh, they see that they're getting better. Oddly enough, they, you know, as athletes, uh, not many athletes are patient and being a person with autism or being on the spectrum or being uh, an autistic person. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't seem to change the level of uh, impatience that people have when they start because they want to be good. Um, but they also develop goals. I want to be this, you know, and they, they come off frustrated they didn't score, but understanding why. And long term, well, we have five, five guys, uh, not guys, five uh, of our members that are, that are lacrosse and barriers that are helping facilitate programs. Five people are one course short of the level one lacrosse, box lacrosse uh, thing. They uh, are going to Red Deer on Saturday with me to facilitate a tryout wheelchair program. Uh, the, we've got people that people that wouldn't leave their house travel to Ontario in May. Uh, as soon as the, ban, the travel ban was lifted at Christmas of last year, I got five calls going, are you booking tickets or what? These are people that wouldn't leave their house because of anxiety, because of fear of a lot of things and providing the right opportunity. Uh, the impact is pretty clear. They belong to a lacrosse team. They are volunteering with things. They now, people that couldn't be in an arena, have seasons tickets to the Calgary Roughnecks. So uh, <laughs> being, being, being allowed to be part of something and not, you know, being afraid to try new things and being supported through that journey has clearly impacted people. Uh, guys, one of the guys actually emailed or texted me and he went and bought his own lacrosse stick and had it, you know, so people are just taking ownership of something and uh, whether it's lacrosse, rugby, climbing, boxing, you know, a guy just bragged on the other day that he sparred with somebody. Oh, that's a guy that, when he heard that it was boxing and not fighting, he was willing to come. Fast forward uh, two years and he's actually able to use a speed bag and even willing to try to use a speed bag. So it's not about, the success isn't in the skill mastery, but they're developing more skills. Certainly makes them a lot more aware that they can succeed and maybe a typical high school, typical club setting isn't the way to get to, for them to discover that. But. Uh, yeah, there you go. That helps. Thank you, Scott. I'm going to jump in there for a second, Leticia, because I think it's really important to highlight what Scott just said about, you know, that sport is a is a pathway to feeling like you have a place in the world, right? It's a it becomes part of your identity. It becomes something that you know you're good at, and everybody deserves to have something that they know they're so good at, or they know that they've made a difference in, that they know is important to them, that they can do and engage in their in their community in some way. And I think sport is a really great opportunity for that to happen. Um, exercise in general is a great place for that to that that live, um, you know, live in your life to the fullest. It really happens. I want to just a, a two, two very brief examples of how this impacts us. <clears throat> we 
I sort of developed a project where I wanted guys to know there was more than the flames or the Calgary Hitmen. Uh, and some minor teams like junior B teams in Ontario and college teams sent jerseys when we were playing ball hockey. And one young fella who now skis competitively because that's what he wants to do. He grabbed a jersey and he, we put it on him and he looked up and he goes, finally, I'm a real hockey player. And that isn't about being able to play hockey, but he was just a kid, just a kid with a stick. And the other example is when we went to Calgary Roughneck Games, some of the players were given the opportunity to be part of a community said, hey, yeah, come on down. And we went down to the floor and uh, the first time they followed the guys along the barrier to try and wait to see them because they didn't want to be forgotten. Fast forward till the end of the season, the guys are standing in the corner of the one end of the saddle dome on the turf, waiting for the roughnecks to jump the barrier and come over and hang out. One of the guys goes, are they going to come? Are they going to come? He goes, yeah, they'll come to us. They're our, they're, my, they're our buddies. They'll... But just having that authority and that agency to not worry about being forgotten and being part of something. And I just walked in, I'm wearing a shirt and the ass lacrosse team is called the Thunder Monkeys Lacrosse Club. And uh, there's a long story there we don't have time for. But um, one of the guys I walked in, he goes, he walked in, he came over, he goes, hey, Scott, say it, do it. And we have a cheer that I, uh, but he just saw me, he goes, you know, that's it. And, he, you know, high five and Thunder Monkeys. Instead of saying, hi, Scott, how are you doing? He wanted to identify and say that he's part of this. And you know, that's just because he got him to come out and just try something and support him. Thank you. Callum, Callum, I'm going to direct the next question to you. Can you tell us how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your physical activity and thus also impacted your mental health? Yeah, um, <clears throat> for me personally, it was a very, very negative. I mean, I think that would be true for anybody, like, especially 2020, 2021, like, um, everything shut down. The gym shut down, um, you know, the YMCA shut down, uh, Special Olympics had to shut down. Um, so you lose the equipment, the space to work out in, uh, the social aspect, because doing it through Zoom is not the same. Um, doing a clunky workout at home isn't the same as going somewhere designed for sports or exercise. Um, so I'd say COVID did really set me back. Um, I don't feel that's the case anymore because everything's opened up again. Um, like I can go to the gym, and I feel safe doing so, which I, uh, I'm aware isn't true for everybody with a disability. Because some people are being compromised or older or, you know, at risk of getting sick. But for me, I can just go to the gym whenever I need to and do what I did without a mask, um, which wasn't possible two years ago. <laughs> so I hope that answers the question. And um, to, I, I guess one thing I should add is that, um, I had to find other ways to maintain my social relationships. Like a lot of my friends I used to play sports with, we ended up playing a lot of video games together because that was something that was, you know, social. That was a group activity that we all had access to that was not like, you know, a risk. Whereas that was like meeting in person was a risk during COVID and we only hit it when numbers were down and, you know, the whole bunch of headachey factors. Um, but now we're back to our sports again, which is nicer. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to find alternative coping strategies during the pandemic, um, even if they weren't nece necessarily, I mean, your, your favorite activities or your primary activities. But um, I will direct this next one to Thomasina. Thomasina, can you tell us what factors you believe promote good and positive mental health for you? I guess that I, since we live out in the country, I guess going for walks is a, I like to go for good long walks around the area of property. Looking at nature, I belong to a nature club. Going, seeing my friends that like curling at the sports I do throughout the year. 
I guess maybe my family is a good one. Just if I got a problem, I can talk to my family about it. That's what I can think of. <laughs> Thank you, Thomasina. Marie, I'll direct the next one to you. Have you seen any direct benefit of sport and physical activity on mental health through the many roles you've held? Oh, absolutely. And and just to concur with uh, Scott, it, it, the, just the joy of sport and well activity it doesn't have to be a sport like thomasina said it can be out going for a walk or looking at nature and it just opens up the possibilities of people it takes the focus off of you know any mental uh, negative self-talk anything like that stress and it just kind of yeah i don't know <laughs> it just opens them up and just um let them relax and let them be themselves and not have to be structured in a classroom or in a you know in any kind of um what a situation but i guess the the caveat to that is that you have to have the people that understand and that can coach or lead people in those situations and and you have to have the experienced people that understand mental health issues and the neurodiverse problems. So that's, I think that's the biggest key and the biggest hurdle that we have is, is having those people in place. And I don't know if that answered the question, but <laughs> sorry. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. The next question Carly and I have um, and I'll direct this to each of our panel members. And you can choose in what order you want to answer, but how do you think we can bring more awareness to how physical activity might improve mental health for people with disabilities? I'll start. I think, um... I always go back to that we need to do better at the school level, right? Like if you're gonna create lifelong habits to get people engaged in physical activity, you really have to start targeting at the younger ages and getting into the schools. And it breaks my heart as a physiotherapist that worked in school, I used to go in um, and they would say, well, if you're gonna come in and see this kiddo, like, can you come in and see them during their phys ed time and take them out and do something with them so that you know, they're not, you're not interrupting their academic preparation. And I'm like, do you have any idea how much better the brain works once you're being physically active? Like they're going to come back reinvigorized and I want them to have that physical activity. So I think, you know, we need to do a lot better at getting that awareness into the schools and into the, the teachers' minds and into the administrators' minds and into the government's minds, um, because that's really where change is going to happen. That's going to make a lifelong lasting difference. I'll jump in, I guess. Um, I think program sharing has helped um, <clears throat> through the Autism Asperger's Friendship Society. And um, our members have created lacrossing barriers because uh, my oldest daughter um, passed away a couple of years ago. And the only reason I say that, uh, and not to be cold or callous, is I start speaking in the past tense and I look at the screen, I can see people's eyes darting side to side going, he's talking about her in the past tense. So. Um, Megan had spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Uh, she loves sports, and and I would reverse engineer everything. And, and one of the mantras with her and anyone I work with is make it authentic and make it earned. I'm not going to say, oh, that's great, because if you know people know when they don't succeed or it's just okay. And she'd love to play lacrosse. Um, it kind of comes into it when your dad's uh, been involved as a coach for 45 years and you're born into it, but. Uh, she would play lacrosse with a lot of the guys from AFS, and one of them came up, uh, oh my goodness, about a year ago, and said we should teach lacrosse to people in wheelchairs. And I'm like, okay, we should, I agree. Uh, can I ask why? And he goes, well, Megan's in Hannah Misser, and I think we, and I want to play lacrosse with people in wheelchairs because she didn't make me feel tall. Bryce is six. 
six foot six and because he's been told he's tall and he just gets anxious and you know and, and so got a hold of uh, the support governing body and I have five members that are one course short because they want to I did they came to me and when we did this thanks to uh, Calgary adapted hub and Karen we started talking about it and we got a hold of some uh, space and some chairs and we had people that on the spectrum that wanted to play and then someone heard about this who had CP and they wanted to come on and someone had an anxiety disorder and um, you know, we started doing it with other people and we've had talks through the Alberta adapted network with ups and downs CP kids and families and other things because some people just don't know and uh, AFS, the Autism Aspergers Friendship Society, we've grown by 20% since the start of the pandemic as more people are understanding things and, and I think program sharing, discussing and letting other people know, I mean I, to me if you want to play across or you want to play rugby uh, as Taylor Price is on uh, who's one of our volunteers um, it doesn't, if you want to play rugby, play rugby. I don't care whether you have one leg or you have cerebral palsy or you have autism or you have downs. And this was sparked for me. Um, I'll make a short story long for just a moment. Um, stop laughing, Leticia. Um, <laughs> uh, Actify, uh, which is a hub out of Scotland. They had an all abilities rugby that is competitive and they have clubs or areas and they have a league. So there's a guy who's in his 60s playing against an international athlete and someone with cerebral palsy and someone with Downs and someone with brittle bone disease. And it's a sliding scale of consent and impact. So that the guy who plays rugby for Scotland can't run through everyone. I mean, he gets the ball, he has to walk unless he walks up and someone's got the same color scrum cap. And you see a guy with cerebral palsy put the ball on his walker and he has an enabler with him who grabs the ball and says, pass now. So this is a tackle as opposed to a full tackle. And if you get a group of people in a room and they want to play rugby or soccer, they'll play, they'll figure out a way, but you have to get them in the room. And if, you know, if uh, Christina brings her son, well, okay. People that have been told you, you need to do it a certain way. Don't mind being the inclusion part. It's not the hard part. It's getting people together and listening to them and letting them experience it the way they need. Uh, and on, I, when we do with rugby, it's you pass the ball and you explain it to somebody and they just, they're not a visual or not a, but you show them copy me and Taylor can, who's on here watching Bryce or Joseph Nickel and he's allowed me to use his name and just copy me and they get the skill down. And then they go to their friends and then their friends or their, their brother who doesn't have any diagnosis wants to play. Just so share programs and say yes to everybody is what I would do. And just one quick thing is the offshoot of that is two of the people, and they've allowed me to use it, <clears throat> that are with AFS are also doing wheelchair lacrosse because one has cerebral palsy but plays mainstream lacrosse. They're both of the Siksika Nation. So in November, we're doing an adaptive lacrosse program through them because they came to this and they told some friends and families on Siksika Nation. So the ripple effect is, you know, there. And we're traveling to Red Deer on Saturday to do a try at wheelchair lacrosse program. So I think you just got to talk about it and connect and find people. Excellent. Thank you. Calum, Tomasino, or Marie, any other thoughts around how we can grow awareness about the importance of physical activity and the role it has within mental health? Yeah, I'd like to... Um back on something Laura said about starting at school level. Um, I think in general, people aren't aware of like the benefits, the, the mental benefits of physical activity and sport. Um, especially on the internet, it's like, kind of like a snobbish, like looking down on sports. Um, and that just shows to me, like a lot of people don't understand that this, is, this isn't just like an activity for fun. It does have impacts on your health that can increase quality of life or um, increase mental awareness again like laura said um i guess for autistic people specifically a big thing in special olympics is the divisioning which is um different um okay the way i describe it is um 
it's competitions for everybody, regardless of ability level. So if you can run 100 meters in 15 seconds or less, uh, you will be racing against other people who can are like with, within that time. And then if you're only able to make that in, let's say like a minute or 30 seconds, then you'd be racing against other people who can also finish around that same time. So that way everyone gets um, competition that is challenging for them, not um, too big a discrepancy. Uh, that's really important for autistics because it's a really broad spectrum. You have people that um, need to be in situations where, where um, most of their competitors will have a disability of some kind. Other times um, that might that might not be enough of a challenge for them, and then they'll need to be either mixed with people that are a mix between those that are disabled and those who aren't. That's our unified sports, and then you have like a couple that are. Um, mostly just in neurotypical circles because uh, that, that's where they feel the most comfortable competing or that's where they get the most challenge from. Um, so I could like, like that, that's, that's where adaptability is really important because there isn't gonna be a one size fits all for autistics. Um, definitely, definitely different levels like we have in Special Olympics, we have our DEC, Recreational, BA. Um, and it's not like a hard category. Like uh, I know at some tournaments they'll have subdivisions um, or they'll have less divisions depending. Like if they have a lot of athletes that are like around this level of ability, they'll split into subcategories, right? Because they're like, okay, we have like 50 can all be considered D level. We'll do high and low. That way it's even more diverse. Um, and that, that's sort of my theme of flexibility there too. Cause it's not about categorizing people, it's about making sure everyone gets the challenge they need that is improving them, but it's not so challenging that it's unfair or alienating. And it's not so easy that, it, that it's boring or condescending, right? It's about finding that, that resistance. Um, yeah, I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, just aware of the time. I know we we booked this for an hour. There's one more question um, for our panel group that I'd love to ask, um, but want to recognize that everybody else probably has other places to be. So I'd like to first say thank you, Carly. Um, wonderful presentation, and thank you to each of our panel members for joining us today. Um, and if you guys have a little bit of flexibility in your schedule, we'll just go through this one more question. Um, it is recorded, so those who had to leave early will be able to catch the answer a little bit later. So um, this question is from Karen Domet. I see you're still on, Karen. Did you wanna did you wanna ask it? Thanks, Laura. Yes, I am asking this question selfishly. Um, um, starting out as the general manager for the 2024 Special Olympics Canada Winter Games here in Calgary. Uh, um, and so I know the importance of the Special Olympics movement, the opportunity that it means for you as a participant to be in the games and importance that and the, the expectation that it has on as the host society that it's our responsibility to create an athlete-centered experience that will be one of the most important and impactful experiences of your entire life um, and how it offers such an incredible growth experience and connection experience and, and all the wonderful things that comes from a, an athlete uh, experience. Um, but, you know, what's What's continued to sit on my mind um, as I'm entering this role is how do we use this platform of hosting this major event that has a large profile, that has um, such a, a large reach within our community? Um, what, what are our opportunities here to create and influence more disability inclusion meaningfully in the community? Um, I know we're going to create more awareness for Special Olympics programs and we're going to generate more volunteer opportunities, but based on, you know, your user experience, um, what do you think is really going to make a lasting legacy impact around disability inclusion in our community? Thomasina, do you mind taking that one? 
Hmm, I have to think. Uh, huh, that's a good, that's actually a really good, good question. Hmm. Can you think of anything, Mom? I, yeah, just promoting it. Just that's, I don't like, yeah, I get into the schools and, and, you know, provincially and nationally, because it's going to be a national games and get into the school with athletes that have participated and, you know, um, do some demonstrations or do some discussion in the school systems and things like that, that, that um, can get people involved I think and having open houses at Special Olympics and at the um, venues venues that yeah that we have and getting yeah you always Special Olympics is always great at using professional sports and professional people to advertise and I don't know why people aren't listening to them because they always have such a great message but I guess just keep up but I guess just keep doing what you're doing and do more of it, I think, is all I can think of. Me too. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in for a second to Karen is because a lot of people will look at a, a special Olympics. Go, I could never do that. But if you have special Olympics athletes going into classes, I found with apps and the crossing barriers and some of your friends that you've gotten to make, they're great ambassadors. They want to be. And they deal a lot more naturally with, you know, showing their medals and being ambassadors and giving that opportunity <clears throat> because it's, it's like trying to look at getting to the top of a mountain and basically you just want someone hiking. And I say that because people look at the end result, which is a special Olympics and someone's result, or I can't even, so I've always wanted to swim. Okay. They, you have to you can never be an olympic swimmer unless you get in the pool and i'm not being sarcastic or trying to create a poster with that but sometimes getting those athletes to go to schools because you can have a big reception and you can have someone from the flames and an olympian um come to uh, do something but get in front of students and say you know my brother has uh this diagnosis or my sister has this I said well that that athlete will say why don't you come out I mean, if I, if I wanted to promote some of the sports, I just, and they've allowed me to use a name, but I just send Bryce and Zeke out to every school in the city and you'd have thousands of people because they're the most inviting natural ambassadors and it gives them a sense of ownership so that they're not just a consumer. Uh, and the parents, the ripple effect is parents come and siblings come, and then you have your volunteer and then you vol you've voluntold and vol and man manipulated people and helping. Face to face is huge. Uh, Kellen, any other thoughts from you on that one? Yeah, um, I definitely think continuing to do what we're doing and um, just reaching out, like especially Mix does, to more organizations. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors that help raise awareness because it's a win-win, right? Like it, like it makes the organization look good that they're donating to charity like us, but also helps spread the word of what we do. Um, I think just more like spreading the word on inclusion uh, and genuine diversity more uh, will help open doors because autism won't be like this unknown to a lot of people. It won't be a scary thing if they meet someone with autism that they'll be more empathetic and uh, more institutions will have rules in place to protect people like us. So I think that that'd be my answer. And that would include, you know, like sports, uh, at, you know, our company or whatever like that. Hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all those insights. And yeah, let, lets me know in, in these very early stages of planning for uh, this first post-pandemic national games that uh, where, where we're headed on thoughts on legacy, you, um, you've all touched on them. So thank you for your valuable input. All right, everyone, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us today. And thank you again, Dr. McMorris, for your presentation and our panel for all your thoughtful insights. I'd like to wish everyone a re happy rest of your Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Yeah, have a good one, everybody. Bye. Take care.